Hello everyone and welcome back to another planetarium stream. Uh, we're very excited for this one. Um, I'm Jessica, I am the planetarium director. Uh, with me is one of our students who I'll let's say hi and introduce herself. Hi everyone, my name is Allie. I'm a biochemistry major at UMD and also a planetarium staff member. Um, so real quick before we get into the meat of today, which I mean, Allie and I are so beyond excited to do, um, I am streaming from a different setup than I normally do. I'm actually in the planetarium right now. So if there are any weird video or audio problems, please let us know in the comments. I think I have everything working. Um, but again, it's a completely new setup for me. So we're, we're, we're hoping everything's going well. Um, okay. So if you didn't know, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope released its first science quality images yesterday, and tonight we are here to talk about that. Um, we'll start off with just a little bit of information about the telescope itself, um, kind of the instruments that it has, and then we'll look at the beautiful images, um, kind of what they mean and what they tell us already and kind of the significance behind all this. Now, if at any time uh, you have questions, feel free to leave them down in the comments. Uh, Allie will be keeping an eye on that. I'm also keeping an eye on it. Um, so we will try and answer them as we see them. If we don't get to your question right away, don't worry. We will make sure to answer it um, by the end of the show, we'll say. Uh, so with that, let me... Get going here. Okay. So, as I said, we're going to start off talking a little bit about the telescope itself. Um, the James Webb Space Telescope is a feat all on its own. Uh, it is the largest telescope that we have sent up into space, and it's looking at uh, a particular range of light to help us study kind of the furthest objects that we can find, which correlates with the earliest stars and galaxies that formed in our universe. Um, so on here, you can see a nice little comparison um, between the size of the Hubble Space Telescope and the size of James Webb. Uh, one of the reasons this is the largest telescope is before James Webb, all of the telescope sizes were limited by the size of the rocket that they went up in. The telescope couldn't be bigger than the rocket. But with James Webb, they did something a little bit different. Um, they made a much larger telescope that could fold up to fit in the rocket. And that, of course, was terrifying because that means everything had to go right once the uh, telescope launched for it to unfold itself and get it into the correct configuration to be a telescope. And it worked perfectly. Um, it's also in a slightly different location than most telescopes. Most telescopes do orbit around the Earth. Um, this one, James Webb, is actually orbiting around the Sun, um, kind of close to the Earth, but far enough away that the Earth isn't a hindrance. And this is because of the type of light that James Webb is looking at. It's looking at infrared light, which we perceive as heat. And the Earth itself gives off a lot of infrared light. And so that's why we need the telescope to be far away from the Earth, so that the Earth's infrared light doesn't outshine anything else that we're trying to look at. Um, so because of that, um, because we're looking at infrared, uh, you have to keep the telescope very cold. And so it has this huge sun shield that blocks the sunlight from the telescope and the instruments so that it can operate at extremely cold temperatures. And that keeps the telescope itself from glowing in infrared and causing, you know, readings that aren't really coming from space, that are coming from the telescope itself. Um, so as I said, James Webb is looking in the infrared part of the uh, light spectrum, whereas Hubble was visible, a little bit of infrared and a little bit of ultraviolet. Uh, James Webb is going much deeper into the infrared than Hubble does, into what we call the mid-infrared. Now, the reason we are looking in infrared is for a couple, a couple of reasons. One, we like to observe the universe 
in many different wavelengths, many different types of light because we can see different things. So for example, here is a beautiful nebula. On the left, you're seeing it in visible light. So this is what it would look like to our eyes. And we see a lot of gas and dust. But because of that gas and dust, it's blocking the view of anything that might be inside of that cloud or on the other side of it. So on the right, you can now see it in infrared. And you're able to pick up a lot of different details because infrared light can pass through gas clouds. Gas clouds don't block your view there. And so we're able to see within the cloud itself and see more information. Um, and so James Webb is going to be able to do that to show us things that Hubble couldn't just because of the type of light that it looks at. Another reason the infrared and mid-infrared was picked, um, as I mentioned, was because we want to try and see the earliest stars in galaxies. So you may know that the universe is expanding. And we can, I think we've done a show on that. If we haven't, then I will add that to the list and talk more about that in a future show. But because the universe is expanding, that also affects the light. As light travels through the universe, it also gets stretched by the expansion of the universe. So all of the light leaving those very early stars and galaxies that started out as visible light or UV or anything like that, by the time it reaches us, it's been stretched into the infrared. And that's why we're using James Webb in the uh, near and mid infrared so that we can see these signals from those very first galaxies that have been stretched to longer wavelengths that Hubble couldn't pick up on. All right, so James Webb has four main instruments that it uh, will use to do science. Uh, first is the near-infrared camera, which is basically a camera that looks in the near-infrared. Um, it's got a lot of cool things to go with it. It can do imaging. It can also do spectra, which is taking the light from an object and spreading it out into uh, like a rainbow uh, so that we can see individual wavelengths. And that can give us information on things like composition, which I'll talk more about in a little bit. Um, it also has a separate near-infrared spectrometer, which does uh, a little bit more fine-tuned stuff than just the camera itself can do. Uh, then we have the mid-infrared um, instrument, which uh, basically is everything the other two, the first two instruments we talked about do in near-infrared, MIRI does in mid-infrared. So it does the same type of work, but looking at a different portion of light. Uh, and then we also have another uh, spectra, uh, spectrometer. Again, taking those individual components of light and letting us see kind of what makes things up. So yesterday, um, they released the first science images. Um, there were five images that were released and these were picked specifically to highlight the work that the four different instruments are capable of doing and showing off the kind of main science goals that James Webb is going to be working on over the, quite honestly, probably decades to come. So I think it's about time that we start looking at some of these images. All right, so the first image that was released was uh, Webb's deep field image. It's of a galaxy cluster called SMACS 0723. What we're seeing right here is not James Webb. This is Hubble's picture of this galaxy cluster. And here is James Webb's. So let's talk about what we're seeing here because I'm sure you've seen this picture floating around, but let's, let's delve into what this actually means. So in the center here, these kind of whitish galaxies, these are all galaxies part of the galaxy cluster. Galaxy clusters are basically groups of hundreds to thousands of galaxies that are all kind of grouped together. And big 
things like galaxy clusters can actually act like a lens, a magnifying glass, to show us things that lie behind them that are even further away. And this happens because mass warps space-time. Um, and I found a really great kind of video, um, very quick, short, to kind of show you what I mean by this. So let me just play this real quick. Be so intense that it can warp the fabric of space time itself. Light, which normally travels in a straight line through space, can show us where this distortion occurs. A very massive object will warp space and bend the path of the light. In a sense, warped space acts like a magnifying glass. A magnifying glass collects and bends light, making light bulbs, for example, appear bigger and brighter. Warp space can do the same thing to light in the galaxy. So what acts like the biggest magnifying glass in space? Galaxy clusters are the most massive things in the universe with the most gravity. When light from a very distant galaxy passes through a cluster, it is amplified and distorted, with the cluster acting like an imperfect magnifying glass. Light that would have gone in the other direction gets bent toward our telescope. That lets us see the very distant galaxy in more detail. This effect is called gravitational lensing. Without this natural boost from gravity, it would be impossible for our telescopes to see far away enough in space and time to study galaxies in the early universe. Okay, so hopefully that kind of explained a little bit what I mean by this, this lensing, gravitational lensing. So when we look back at this picture, you can see that there are smudges that appear to be curved. Those are galaxies that are behind the cluster that we're seeing because of the gravitational lensing. Uh, so these are all gravitationally lensed galaxies. Now let me hop out of this for a second and actually bring up the full resolution image, um, which if you want to go see all of the full resolution images and more information about them, I do have a link in the video description so that you can go to all of that. So what's also amazing taking a look at this is how much detail there is. As you zoom in, every little smudge that you're seeing, that's another galaxy. And a lot of these are galaxies that are behind the cluster so far away. In fact, we know how far away some of these galaxies are, and I'll show you that in a second. Um, we got a question about the colors. I will come back to that. I actually have a slide on that. Um, so let me go to that, actually. Um, so because James Webb does observations in infrared, this is not what we would see with our eyes. But they still colored the image kind of similarly to how our eyes work in that the shorter wavelengths are colored blue and the longer wavelengths are colored red. Um, and so it, it mimics how our eyes work, but it's showing us light that our eyes can't actually see. Um, so the one that I just showed you was the image that was taken with the near cam, with the near infrared camera, but they also did it with the mid infrared camera. And you can really see a big difference here in looking at the different type of light. Um, here, what we're seeing with all of the red in the Miri image, we're actually seeing dust in these galaxies. These are really dusty galaxies that have lots of thick gas and dust clouds. And that's important because that's where stars are born. And so it's showing us how these early galaxies have lots and lots of gas and dust to form stars out of. And so this helps us by studying these early galaxies but to understand one, how galaxies form and how they evolve and how these different populations of stars uh, come about and what the timing and everything is like. So it helps us piece together what happened in our universe to get us to where we are today. Um, so uh, let me actually real quick, because I think I have the Mary one. Yeah, I do. 
Um, so again, you can zoom in and see all of the little galaxies. Now, you'll notice that not everything is there, like we saw in the near infrared. Um, and again, that's just because we're looking at a different part of the light. Uh, not everything gives off the same amount or the same types of light. Uh, and this is, of course, the benefit to looking at different types of light. Okay, now, in addition to the beautiful images that the two cameras got, uh, they also got spectra, which allowed us to look at a few things. First, in the image, remember we saw that there were lots of these like curved and arced galaxies. Those are the ones being gravitationally lensed. They were able to confirm that several of these curves are actually the exact same galaxy that we're just seeing lensed multiple times, which is really cool. Um, by getting the spectra for a lot of the tiny little smudges that I showed you when we zoomed in, we're actually able to figure out how far away the galaxies are. And some of these are back 13.1 billion light years away, meaning we're seeing that galaxy as it was 13.1 billion years ago. That's less than a billion years after the Big Bang. These are the very beginnings of the galaxies. Not only can we tell how far away they are, but with these spectra, we can look at what gases we're seeing in the galaxy. And this is significant because right after the Big Bang, the only elements in our universe were hydrogen, helium, and a tiny little bit of lithium. In this galaxy, which we're seeing 13.1 billion years in the past, we're already seeing elements other than that. These are elements that are born inside of stars, that are created during the life and deaths of stars. That tells us that by this time, by 13.1 billion years ago, which is about, what, 0.7 billion years after the Big Bang, um, again, less than a billion years, there's already been several generations of star formation that have happened to create these elements that we're now seeing. So this isn't even the very first generation of stars that we're seeing. That's going to be in a galaxy even farther away. The other, and I forgot to mention this, um, let me go back real quick. The other crazy thing about this image is how much of the sky it represents. Uh, this field that we're seeing is the equivalent of if you were to take a grain of sand and hold it out at arm's length. That's how much of the sky this represents. And take a look again at Hubble's versus James Webb's. There's a reason we wanted James Webb to be as big as it was. This image from Hubble took a total accumulation of about two weeks worth of collecting light to get this image. For James Webb, it took 12 hours. And that's because of how much bigger the telescope is. In that short amount of time, we were already getting better images, better deep field images than Hubble was able to do in weeks worth of time. This is why we're so excited. Okay, I think I talked about the first one enough. Um, Allie, is there anything else that we need to hit on the first image before we move on? I don't think so. I think that you hit all of the pre-core <laughs> topics. Um, but this is definitely one of the most exciting pictures from the web. And I will say, I was shocked when I found out that this was the first one they were releasing. Because I thought this was going to be the, like, prime money shot. This was going to be... But as we'll see in a little bit, um, their final image was absolutely worth being the grand finale. But we'll get to that. I'm also not too proud to admit that I definitely teared up when I first saw this image. I got hit in the emotions real hard. Um, all right, let's take a look at the next thing. The next thing that they oh, show yeah. us. Oh, we actually have one more uh, question. Okay. Um, is the light sparkle a natural feature or from the sun? Ah, 
So are you talking about the, the spikes on the stars is what I'm assuming you're talking about? I think so, yeah. Um, so those are called diffraction spikes. And they actually happen because of, one, the shape of the mirror of the telescope, but also because of the struts that are supporting the secondary. Um, so they actually put out a really cool kind of infographic that explains this. So on Hubble's, you see kind of a, a T-shape with just four spikes. And on Webb, you see this because it's a combination of the shape of the mirror, which is a hexagon, and the shape of the struts. It has this kind of three strut um, construction. And that combined gives the diffraction spikes that we're seeing. Um, and that's actually how you can know, looking at these images, what's a star and what's a galaxy. Stars are bright enough that you will see those spikes, whereas galaxies are faint enough that you're really usually not going to see them. So like this and this one down here, these, these are stars in our own galaxy that are uh, along our same kind of line of sight as the part of sky that we were looking at. Um, very good question. Okay, so the second thing that they released was the spectra of the atmosphere from the exoplanet WASP-96b. Um, now, what they did was they watched the exoplanet system for, I believe it was a little under six and a half hours, so that they could watch as the planet passed in between us and the star it's orbiting around. Now, when it passes in front of the star, it blocks part of the star's light, and the overall light that we get from the system dips. That's how we know there's a planet. This is the transit method. Um, this is how we have found the majority of the exoplanets that we have found. But what James Webb is able to do while this transit is taking place some of the star's light is going through the planet's atmosphere. And that allows us to get information on the composition of the atmosphere. Now, this planet is not a type of planet that we have in our solar system. It's called a hot Jupiter. Um, so it's a Jupiter-sized planet, but it sits uh, extremely close to its star. So it's at about one ninth the distance between the sun and Mercury. So super, super close. It completes one orbit around its star, I think in like three days. Um, so it's a very, very hot kind of puffy planet. Um, but what we see here in this data that they released is undeniable signatures of water vapor in the atmosphere. This is the first indisputable proof that there is water in an atmosphere outside of our solar system. Um, not only that, but based off of how big these bumps are, they're actually smaller than we expected. That tells us the atmosphere probably has clouds. And the overall shape of the spectra leads us to believe that there's also some haze in the atmosphere as well. And again, this was, this was six hours, six hours worth of observing. And we've already gotten more information about the planet of an exoplanet, or about the atmosphere of an exoplanet than we've ever had before. And this is just, this is just the start. Okay, um, let's head to the third image that was released was of the Southern Ring Nebula. Um, so again, this is Hubble's image of the Southern Ring Nebula. It's a planetary nebula. Um, and so in the middle, you have a star uh, similar in size to our sun that has died. In dying, it has kind of expelled um, all of the gas that made up the star, leaving behind uh, the dead core of the star, which we call a white dwarf. In this particular system, we actually know that the central is actually a binary star system. So there's the white dwarf that died to create the planetary nebula, and then there's another star there as well that hasn't died yet, but will add its own stuff once it reaches the end of its life. Okay, so this is the Hubble image. 
and this is the James Webb. Um, already just so much more detail. Um, same thing with the colorings. Uh, you see the blues are the shorter wavelengths, the reds are the longer wavelengths. Again, this is not exactly how we would see it with our eyes because this is infrared light. But let me pull up the full resolution. I mean, just this detail that you're able to see in the structure of the gas cloud. You can see that there are kind of multiple shells of gas telling us that the star shed its outer layers in multiple episodes. Um, we can also see it's all kind of churned up and that's because of the binary system. As those two orbit around each other, that kind of churns up the gas that is surrounding them in this nebula. And it's just beautiful. And just in the background, too, are just galaxies. There, there's just galaxies everywhere. And this is a particularly beautiful edge-on galaxy here. But it's just, it's stunning. It's stunning. Um, let's see. Uh, also did it in mid-infrared. And so you're able to see a little bit more detail uh, within the gas cloud. I know, it's beautiful. Um, and let me go, I should have just gone straight to this one. Um, so with this one, because we're looking in mid-infrared, um, what you're seeing in here is the thick, kind of really thick clouds of gas and dust. But you can much more easily distinguish the two objects in the center. The redder one is the white dwarf. And it's red because it's surrounded by that gas and dust that it expelled. Um, whereas this is our still living star uh, that hasn't died yet. But you just see so much more detail and you see kind of the different, uh, like I was saying, the different shells and so the different episodes of, of this expulsion that happened. It's beautiful. It's beautiful that yeah that was my last one on that so that is the southern ring nebula um let's see if there's anything i missed i don't think so okay so the fourth uh image that was released was of uh, Stevens Quintet. This is a group of five galaxies that all appear near to each other. Um, and four of them, these four here, are actually very close together and they're all interacting. Um, and so these are four galaxies that are all kind of interacting um, and merging. And, and so you see lots of like swirls of gas as things are pulled, as galaxies swing nearby each other. And then this little guy is much closer to us. He just happens to be along our line of sight. Um, so this is the Hubble image. And this is the James Webb image. And this is a combination of both the near and mid infrared. They stack together into the same image so that we can see the details from both. Um, and it's just stunning. It's stunning. Like, I was worried that this entire show was going to be nothing but me going, it's beautiful. But, I mean, really, it is. Um, so if we take a look at the foreground galaxy here, those little dots, those are individual stars. We are actually seeing individual stars in a galaxy that is, hold on, let me have it, that is 40 million light years away. 40 million light years, and we're seeing individual stars. Not to mention, we're also seeing all of the clouds of gas and dust where star formation is taking place inside of this galaxy. And then if we take a look at the four that are interacting, we see a lot more of all of the gas and dust that's being pulled out and streamed out as the galaxies have been interacting and swinging by each other and slowly merging together. So we're able to see just so much more detail. And then again, in the background, it's just galaxies. There are galaxies everywhere. Uh, just, just all over the place. 
Um, so like I said, this was the combination of both the near and mid infrared. Um, this is just the near infrared. Um, and then this is just the mid. And that's really highlighting the clouds of gas and dust. That's what the mid infrared does. It really highlights those cool gas clouds. Um, now the other thing, uh, this galaxy up here, this top one, which you can see is really, really bright in the mid infrared, that's an active galactic nuclei. That is a supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy that is currently ingesting lots and lots and lots of material that's falling into the black hole and that's giving off a tremendous amount of light as that material kind of grows closer and falls into the black hole. And that's why it is so incredibly bright here. Um, and they were able to get detailed look at this gas and dust that's surrounding this supermassive black hole. Uh, so much so that we can see what types of gases there are in those gas clouds. We're able to see how the composition differs a little bit, depending on where you look. Uh, we're able to trace out where specific gases are. And we're able to see how fast it's moving. So we can tell how fast that stuff is spiraling in into that supermassive black hole at the center. So much information that we're able to get here. All right, I think that brings us to, and I'm way over time. Well, not way, but I'm going to be by the time I finish this. Uh, that brings us to our fifth and final image that was released, which is of the Carina Nebula. Uh, this is a star forming region within our galaxy. Uh, this is uh, the Hubble image of the Carina Nebula. And just, this is the James Webb. I just can't even, let me, let me just go straight to the big one because like just, it looks unreal. Like, this does not look like something that is actually really in our universe. But this is. I'd also just like to say that this makes a super great uh, background wallpaper <laughs> on a computer. Um, and if you would like to use this background on your phone, you will have to decide which part of it you would like to show on your phone. And that's a very difficult decision. It's so difficult. <laughs> it really is. Oh, uh, so, okay. Part of the reason, again, it looks different as we're looking at different types of light. Um, so with the Hubble, we had a lot of the stars that were inside of the gas cloud that were blocked because of that gas. But looking in the infrared, we're able to actually see all of these young stars that are forming inside of the gas cloud. Um, if we zoom on in, we can just see the structure as these new young stars are shaping the gas around them and pushing it around and clearing out areas. We're able to see jets coming off of these young forming stars. And this is incredibly important to help us understand how star formation takes place. What happens as a star is forming out of these clouds of gas? And this is the type of detail that we can see it and that we can tell. Like, it's just. Like I was saying, I was shocked that the deep field wasn't the finale. But as soon as I saw this, I understood. Um, now, they did also do a portion of it in the mid infrared. Um, which allows us to look even deeper into the gas cloud and see even more. Um, and again, just seeing all of the structure and all of these young little stars that are being born. It's amazing. It's, I have no words. I have no words. 
Yes. Okay. So we just got a question. Is it true that our bodies are made of stardust? And yes. Um, as I said uh, earlier, right after the Big Bang, um, the beginnings of the universe, the only elements that existed were hydrogen, helium, and a little bit of lithium. We are, of course, made up of stuff other than that. Everything else that exists on our periodic table was created either inside of a star during its lifetime or created when a star died. Everything that makes us up is because of generations and generations of star formation that took place. The stars died, that material then was sent back out into the universe and collected in new clouds of gas that collapsed to form new generations of stars. So we are here thanks to generations and generations of stars that formed before our solar system did and that seeded our solar system with the other stuff that makes the planets and us. So we, we are star stuff. We are stardust. Uh, yeah, that is, <laughs> I think, the finale. <laughs> um, quickly, um, if... Uh, like I said before, uh, if there is, if you want to go and look at or download all of these high-res images yourself um, and see more information on what exactly all the images are and everything that took place to get them, how we see them, um, I have that link down in the video description. Um, someone also made a really awesome comparison tool here. Uh, so that you can go and really see how Hubble compares to James Webb. Um, and I linked that in the video description as well, so that you can go and explore and kind of see all of this for yourself. Um, and then there's also just some links to information on James Webb itself, if you want to know more about it. I think I've done enough just geeking out over <laughs> I don't know Ali anything else you want to you want to add in there I don't think so I mean I'm just in like total agreement that these pictures are so important to science and just the amount of data that we're going to get from these even just like the exoplanet atmosphere like all these images are stunning they're just so important to science and I think that's just part of what makes them so beautiful um, yeah. Especially for me coming into like fields of science, knowing that these are just paving the way for us to make new discoveries is so exciting. No, it is. And I've mentioned like I'm so jealous of everyone that's going to get to to utilize James Webb. Like, I mean, I will still get to talk about it and teach about it and use it. But I am jealous of the astronomers who are going to get to do actual research with it. Um, little, little jealous there. <laughs> But no, I think that's kind of one of the things we really wanted to get across tonight was not just how beautiful the images are, which they are, but why they're so important. We're seeing so much new stuff that we weren't able to see before. And this is just, you know, a couple of days of observing. That's it. This is the very beginning and it is already outperforming anything else that we've had, showing us views that we have never seen before and it's it's beyond thrilling um yeah and now we just have a couple decades <laughs> with this telescope to take observations and learn and yeah it's gonna be it's gonna be great all right um i think we'll give kind of one last call for for any questions um, otherwise, I think we will wrap it up. Um, I know that I had the weekly schedule in the pre-show slides that I completely forgot to update for this week. Um, so this week shows um, Friday we're doing, I think it's Expedition Moons. Is that what we're doing Friday? Uh, hold on, I'm pulling it up. Yes, we're doing Expedition Moons Friday. Um, and then Saturday uh, is the same shows that we've uh showing all Saturday this month. So we have um, two small pieces of glass in the afternoon at two, and then at the evening at seven, it is, I completely forgot what we're showing, big astronomy. 
that's what we're showing. Um, and we will also be showing, because I, I did just get all of these images into our system so that you can see it on the full big dome. We will be showing those at the shows this weekend, and honestly, probably for the next few weeks. Uh, so coming to the planetarium, you'll get to see these in full dome glory. And I have to tell you, if you thought these things are beautiful just on your computer screen, it is something else seeing it in the planetarium. And I know, Ali, I can't wait to show you next time you're here, <laughs> which I guess will be next week. For um, Yeah, it's, it's stunning. So, all right. Oh, yeah. So much about the possibilities of life. Um, I mean, we, we are seeing there's so much out there. And yeah, it's, it's, as they've been saying, it's a whole new era for astronomy. And it truly is. All right. I think I need to stop geeking out. And we have people coming to the planetarium in a little bit. So I gotta get things ready for that. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, I hope that. Uh, just a little bit of our excitement rubbed off <laughs> and that you understand not only just the beauty, but also the huge importance to the field of astronomy and science that this telescope is. Uh, and you can absolutely bet you we will keep you updated on all of the fun stuff happening with James Webb. Uh, so with that, thank you again for joining us. Uh, we hope to see you in the future, either at future streams or in person here in the planetarium. Uh, but have a wonderful rest of your evening, and we'll see you next time. Bye, everyone.